So good morning, everyone. My name is Denise Anderson, and I am the CEO and founder of Denise Anderson and Associates, which is a public health and healthcare consultancy firm. We offer organizational capacity development, curriculum development and facilitation, as well as research. And I am going to ask each of the panelists to say hello and briefly introduce themselves in 30 seconds or less. And just as a reminder that the bios are, um, you can locate them with the QR code in the agenda. So we will start with Casey for your 30 second hello and introduction. Hi, my name is Casey Mose. I am a director of business development at CWT uh, in the North American region. Prior to that, I served 22 years in the US Army. And in that time, I led and was led by many different people. I lived and worked among many different cultures. And I was witness to and played a very small role in the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Thank you. OK, thank you, Casey. Diana, you're up next. Thank you. Hello, I'm Diana Dominich. I am the owner of Accelerate Consulting Experts. Uh, certified minority and women-owned business. Uh, we're a diversity consulting company that works with corporations and medium-sized companies in developing and enhancing their diversity initiatives. Thank you, Diana. And last but certainly not least, Maria. Good morning, everybody. I'm Maria Heidkamp. I am the still relatively new Chief of Innovation and Partnership at the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. Prior to that, I was with the Heldrick Center for Workforce Development for 16 and a half years, where I did a lot of work on um, older and long-term unemployed job seekers. Uh, before that, I spent time overseas for the U.S. Department of Labor and U.S. Agency for International Development, helping the Hungarian government develop programs to address mass layoffs and plant closings. So I have lived and worked abroad as well as in the U.S., but delighted to be here, and thank you. Thank you, Maria. So the following excerpt described this panel's discussion. When it comes to non-traditional roles, businesses have had to play catch up with hiring and training to ensure they're not excluding people who aren't the traditional candidate. So the phrase non-traditional needs context. My first question for each of the panelists is, how would you define or characterize non-traditional candidates. Diana, you want to start? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a great question because uh, I think it, it really begs, begs a follow-up question of what is traditional? Um, what does that mean today? Uh, is it a term that we should be using? Um, or is there alternative language that, that we should be using to address it? So when we first started having the discussion, it, it really kind of piqued my interest to say, well, how how would one define traditional versus non-traditional to then, you know, do we start to create a box? Do we start to create boundaries um, that maybe we shouldn't? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maria? <clears throat> uh, if I can, with the, uh, the moderator's permission, I'm going to talk a little bit about the concept of traditional and non-traditional as it applies to community college students. Um, I think, you know, sometimes people still think of traditional college students as being 18 to 21 year olds who go to school full time and are supported by their families. Um, by contrast, the reality, and I, I do have some statistics here, in New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, that, that that kind of 18 to 21 year, year old group makes up less than half of our 180,000 community college students. There's a younger group um, who are dual enrollment students attending high school and, and community college at the same time, but basically one in three community college student is over 21 and um, about 20% are over the age of 30. Um, many of them work full time. Um, of our students, 57% attend part-time, so that's, that's you know, well over half of the students are part-time students, but again, many of them have full-time jobs or part-time jobs while they're in school. Um, they are disproportionately from marginalized and low-income backgrounds. New Jersey's community colleges educate higher shares of black and Hispanic students than four-year colleges do. Nationally, 30% are the first in their families to attend college, and one in five college students is a student parent. So 
you know, when, when we're thinking about traditional and what that means, a traditional worker, a traditional student, I think we really have to put it in the context of what our reality is. And, you know, we have an incredibly diverse, hardworking, driven population of community college students um, of all ages. Many of them have other challenges they have faced that we have um, justice impacted individuals, we have refugees, we have um, DACA recipients and others. So it's, it's, there is no traditional college student at this point in our community college systems. Thank you, Maria. Casey, why may some veterans be considered non-traditional and what might employers be overlooking? Why might some veterans? Veterans, oh yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just say that, um, uh, and this was you know, part of our, our initial conversation, um, some veterans may not think about themselves as non-traditional at all. They're not, they're in, they've been in the subculture so long that they don't know what you're thinking of them or not thinking of them when they come in. Um, I never thought of my, myself in that time in the army as non-traditional, but when you put it in the context of a female um, in law enforcement, and then when I look around as I went up in the ranks and I was the only woman in the room or um, only person in the field or working among um, other cultures that didn't necessarily respect women the same way the United States did. Very much non-traditional. So I would just say that, put that lens on that when you're interviewing someone, they may not think about themselves in that same context. Mm -hmm. You also made a great point when we were preparing for this, that typically when we are recruiting and onboarding and we set out job descriptions and we have educational requirements, we have experience requirements, that sometimes, um, the veterans may not have those educational requirements, but they have yields of field work. Would you expand upon that for me? Sure. Yes. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's the army's all encompassing, especially if you're talking about or all the military services being at war for however many years. Uh, they didn't have time to do that um, after work, uh, college hours that it requires to get their degree. Um, there's a lot of programs in place afterwards, but they do have if they've been in five years, 10 years, they've worked among different cultures, they've led different teams, they uh, may have very many special skills, but they didn't get the certification that they need. Now the Army's doing their best and the, the DOD is doing their best to, to try to smooth that transition over, but sometimes you may have to look at um, what does it, is there something else that qualifies this individual outside of just the degree? And can you take a chance on them to give them the opportunity to get their degree while they're working for you? You know, is that gonna be a good return on investment? And I think that um, we'll talk more about this later. You'll see that it, it will be. Okay. Can, can I can I piggyback on Absolutely. that for a second? Um, the community colleges are definitely interested in expanding opportunities for veterans and to try and give them credit for that prior learning, so that whereas they may not have had formal classroom training, they have incredible experience and you know work experience and other training that should translate. To credit to make it easier if they do want to get a, a traditional degree, they can accelerate that process. So, and that's true for we're talking about non-traditional, I guess for for older workers too, who sometimes maybe didn't get a degree or didn't finish a degree, but do have lots of work experience, and there are more efforts to try to um, sort of systematically figure out how to give people credit for those kinds of experience and work-based um, skills. Great, thank you. So non-traditional, definitely some feelings about the use of that word. Um, oftentimes in this space, we also talk about non-dominant. And so if I'm going to follow up with what Dr. Douglas spoke about just momentarily, we're talking about those protected classes and you know non-discriminatory practices as it relates to race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, religion, sexual orientation, able-bodied, all of those things. Next, keeping with today's theme, elephants and shifting sands. In various DEI discourses, both affirmative action and DEI are covertly, if not overtly, misunderstood as a mechanism of recruiting unqualified representative candidates. What are we aiming to achieve with DEI and fairness? Maria, let's start with you. 
um, you know, I think we should be trying to achieve um, equitable opportunities, access to opportunities. And I think what happens sometimes, if you take, for example, older workers or older long-term unemployed workers, they may have a gap on their resume, but they may be absolutely qualified for the job in question. But then they get blocked by an automated hiring system that will say, okay, there's a six month gap. Well, that candidate then doesn't progress in the process. So, I mean, I think we need to think about um, what are the, and it may not be, it's not like a, 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 they're intentionally trying to exclude older job seekers so much. It's just that is the inadvertent aftermath of, of, of certain policies. The same thing can happen sometimes with jobs that say they need a four-year degree, um, but maybe don't need a four-year degree. It might be some combination of maybe a two-year degree or a, a workforce credential of some sort and some experience um, would, would leave somebody perfectly qualified because by having that four-year degree written into the criteria, you exclude populations that are less likely to have four-year degrees, and that includes a lot of black and Hispanic individuals and individuals who may come from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So, you know, I, I think we really need to find out how to make sure that there are opportunities that people have equal access to um, as a starting point. So. Thank you, Maria. Casey, I believe you have a first-person hiring panel experience that you can share with the audience this morning. Yes, um, I think, first of all, answering the question, what are we achieving with DEI? I think you're, you're going for the best talent, right? You want the best talent. You want to hire the best people. Um, I sat on a panel when I worked at US Army Africa, and um, I sat on several panels. And many times, one of the criteria was, you know about US Army Africa, you've worked with them before, you've, you've touched them somehow, you don't, it won't take a long time for you to understand the mission. Well, this particular panel, one of the criteria were, was, we want someone who's never worked with US Army Africa before. We want someone who's never touched it. And I was like, blown away because every other panel I'd sat on, that was one of the main things to kind of earn you a couple points to be higher in the hiring scheme. But what they were looking for is, we realized we had all these people, we kept hiring the same people, we kept getting the same thoughts, and we needed something different to really get the perspective, to get that critical thinking that you need. So you, that was one of the things that they explained. And uh, I think they did achieve a better hire and they got better talent and a better functioning directorate because of it. Okay, thank you. And Diana, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think as, as, we, think about, um, as we think about DEI and for our future, um, you know, a, a startling statistic in 2014, um, the birth rate flipped. The majority of um, birth rate was of minorities. So if we think about that, those children are probably about 10 years old. We got about another eight or so years before they start to enter the workforce. And we're naturally going to start to see a shift in the majority becoming the minority, um, the minority becoming the majority. <laughs> so I think part of our work as DEI practitioners is to think about how we foster that culture in the environment um, to welcome them in. Um, they'll come and they'll change it anyway, um, but how do we start to shift some of that and, um, and create some of that momentum um, to allow them to come in? It's also going to be smart economics for our, um, for our country if we um, if we don't start to shift the power, start to um, start to shift the wealth. Um, what can potentially happen is the United States can become, say, like a country like India. Um, country like India, seventy percent of the wealth is controlled by one percent of the population. So if we don't start thinking about how we leverage this runway that we have, which is getting shorter and shorter as years go on, mm -hmm. but fostering these environments, building up, um, building up that talent, um, creating those pathways to allow for individual, many different types of individuals to have those opportunities. Um, it, we're, it will potentially hurt us as a country. Okay. I'm pretty confident that many, if not most of us in the room, would agree that relationships, trust, and loyalty are core to business relationships, including hiring. One of the first steps that many businesses take to identify talent is through their social and cultural networks. And this is something that Dr. Douglas also spoke about. The issue is that for some, 
those social and cultural networks are a reflection in the mirror, lacking diversity. Therefore, too often, when discussing recruiting non-traditional candidates, some businesses struggle to identify qualified diverse candidates. So what tips can you offer in recruiting representative candidates? Casey, you have a model to share, the skill, build, skill bridge model? Yes, um, so if you're recruiting veterans, and um, I wish this model could be duplicated for, for many different places, but this is specific to veterans. And, um, and it's because so many veterans, once they transitioned from the Army, had a hard time getting hired. I think, I think the success rate was like 25%. It took them a, a long time. So what the DOD did, and I'm gonna talk about the Army, but please just think about all the services, is they made an agreement that if your commander, your unit agreed to release you um, six months prior to your retirement or transition, that you could sign up to intern, essentially, with a different company. And they would continue to pay you your army salary or your your uh, military salary that time. And you would be reporting to work at whatever that business was. For me, it was with an emergency management company that was remote, so I was at home. But nine to five, I belonged to that company. And it, that is a sacrifice that the army is making to give you up that time. But if you've spent that time with them and you've spent all that and, you, and these people care about you, they want you to successfully transition to another job. So what's great is that any organization, big or small, you could have two employees or you could have um, 10,000 can be a part of that program. They can sign up to be to to take transitioning veterans. Um, it really is at no risk to them because they're not paying your wage. The military is paying your wage. The risk is you have to invest that time in that person. And it gives a little bit of um, time for you to see if this person doesn't have a degree or they don't have a, their PMP or they don't have XYZ, are they still going to be a good fit in my company? And even if it doesn't work out, you got essentially six months of, of a good relationship, a good you know experience with that person, and they got maybe that renewed confidence. They translated some of that military civilian lingo. There's just it's, it's a win-win in almost every situation. I, I love that. I absolutely, because that's got some of the, the best elements of good workforce development practices. It gives you some on the job experience. So then the, the veteran has these things they can add to their resume, as you say, translating some of it from military to civilian, you know, the, the employer can, can see your skills regardless of what was on your resume before, whatever the traditional degrees you may or may not have. But, you know, and that's, we've tried, we tried when we were at the, when I was at the Heldrick Center working with older long-term unemployed job seekers to do something similar to get them a returnship opportunity or something where if they can get a foot in the door, you know, it's the employer doesn't have to make a commitment, but, you know, if they sort of test out somebody, it is, it's just such a good way to um, advance those kinds of hiring opportunities. And so, you know, and there are other models. Um, I'm, I'm not an ex or expert in veterans employment, but we also worked with veterans who were older and long-term unemployed, you know, and looked at some, there was, um, I think it was called American Community Partners, but that was a model where at the companies that were members of this network, typically had a veteran who would serve as a mentor to um, a veteran that they're hiring. So they, you know, I think sometimes mentoring can be very important as somebody is trying to transition to a new work setting. So, um, but then if I can go on with your Absolutely. question, um, you know, I think partnering with nonprofits or in the workforce lingo, workforce intermediaries um, can be one way to access different talent pools AARP, for example, of course, has very large programs where they identify employers that are, and I hate the term, but mature worker friendly or, you know, where, right, where they make a commitment to making sure that their um, older workers have opportunities, you know, so you can partner with groups like AARP. You can partner with New Jersey's community colleges because <laughs> as I rattled off all those statistics before, I mean, we have a diverse student body and you know they're qualified, they're talented. Right now, in partnership with BIA, we have this Pathways to Careers initiative. Um, the four key industries we're focusing on at this point are health services, very broadly defined, 
um, technology and innovation, infrastructure and energy, and manufacturing and supply chain management. So almost everything can find a place in one of these pathways, but the idea is to, to build better opportunities um, for sort of students from you know, middle school and high school to get career exposure, um, high school to college, those transitions for college students, whether they're going to careers or to four year, you know, going on to more education, but with a lot of employer engagement, employer input. And I have to say, we had a student and alumni convening on Saturday, it was first ever, and it was terrific. We had students from all across the state and um, internships was a huge topic. These guys need paid internships. Mm -hmm. And what happens a lot of times is that these community college students, they cannot afford to take an unpaid internship, even if that would advance their career or their learning. So, you know, they get excluded sometimes. Um, one gave an example, one person gave an example that um, I won't name the company, but it is a company we all know and love. And, you know, it's, I'm not going to name them, but she wanted to apply for, she's a STEM background and she actually recently got into med school, so she's you know advancing in her career. But she applied, um, wanted to apply for this internship that was geared to students who had completed their freshman year of college. She would completed her freshman year of college, but at a two-year institution, they only would accept people who had completed freshman year of college at a four-year institution, even though it was the perfect opportunity for her. So. You know, when you hear these kinds of stories, and I don't think the company was trying to exclude this immensely talented young woman. I think they just thought college and, you know, here's a list of four years that we hope you went to. And, and I don't, I'm not sure it was some nefarious intent, but I think we have to go back and look at, you know, when are there these, these policies that are excluding talented people? So I'll stop there, but. Uh, Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Thank you. Diana, what would you add? Yeah, so um, building off of Maria starting off saying it's about the partners that you have. Um, I also encourage a lot of my clients, and we work a lot on looking at what their supply chain looks like as part of their partnerships. So from a recruiting perspective, um, who are your recruiting partners? But more importantly, what's the makeup of those companies? Um, one of my clients is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And for them, it was very important to have diversity. They um, position a diversity of thought. Um, and so they had a, um, they were looking for new recruit, recruiting partners. And in working with them, um, we said, okay, we're looking to um, diversify the panel of partners that they have. And um, we set a goal to say, let's have at least 40% of them um, be owned by maybe if we want to say non-traditional owners, <laughs> minorities, women, LGBT, mm -hmm. veterans, mm -hmm. disabled people. Um, and it's found that for companies where the owner um, is diverse in nature, it's about 70% of their staff tends to be diverse in nature as well, looks, wow. like, mm -hmm. looks like the owner. Um, and so by naturally looking at, looking at the ownership of those partners, um, you're then going to bring in that diversity of thought, that diversity of perspective. And so I, I encourage um, folks to think about that as another, another option. There, I mean, there are tons of great organizations out there for recruiting veterans, recruiting disabled, recruiting minorities, but your supply chain is another place to look. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. I want to just, before we move on, go back to assessing your social and cultural networks and intentionally striving to diversify. So I want everyone to answer several questions rhetorically for me. What percentage of your social network shares your demographics? Question number two. What percentage of the information sources you rely on share your demographics? And question number three. What percentage of the heroes or the protagonists in your favorite books, films, shows, and games share your demographics? So if your answer is more than 50% to any of the questions I posed, your networks and what you consume could use more representation to build those relationships, trust, and loyalty with diverse populations. 
Another consideration here in New Jersey and all throughout the U.S. is to work with the diverse chambers in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. We have the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey, the United States Women's Chamber of Commerce New Jersey chapter, the statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey, the New Jersey Veterans Chamber of Commerce, the New Jersey LGBT Chamber, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so with intentionality, we can achieve the things that we're talking about today. Three years into the COVID-19 pandemic, recruitment and retention remain a formidable challenge facing businesses today. Recruitment is the starting point. Inclusivity and retention once onboarded come next. Again, I didn't speak with Dr. Douglas before this, but we are in <laughs> sync here. How can businesses create inclusive work environments and retain representative employees during this era of quiet quitting and great resignation? Diana, I'm going to start with you this time. Ooh. Can you start with Maria? <laughs> 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 Do you accept yes, the pass? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the um, the the work that the work that DEI professionals do in um, in creating an environment and creating a sense of belonging um, is really important because I think um, we're making we've been making progress in getting the folks in the door, um, but then getting them to stay is um, is a big part, and a large part of that is. Um, folks feeling like I don't belong. Mm -hmm. I don't belong here. Um, you know, I think it, that that inner voice can um, can speak that. Um, and if there is a community that exists for them to find their place, um, to feel that sense that they belong is important. And so, um, around D D and I, one of my um, one of my clients, they're a wine and spirits distributor, um, and they've been having large turnover in their staff. And for them, they bought the solution. Um, and what's been working for them um, was creating ERGs. Um, but we didn't go necessarily with just the traditional route of having a, um, a, an African-American ERG, a Hispanic ERG, but really tapped into and went out and surveyed the employees um, to find out what else, they were, um, what else they were gathering around, what other interests they had that would allow them to create that community um, within the company and then um, create a little bit more of that stickiness so they found others that they could relate to and then uh, work became, they weren't only valued for the work that they did, but then also had that sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Maria. good that she finished that question. <laughs> <laughs> We're all off the hook, but no, no I think, um, you know, it, it remains a historically tight labor market, right? There are some signs that maybe there's a tiny bit of softening, but it is basically still a historically tight labor market. So I think employers have a lot of incentive to be open-minded, to cast a very wide net in their hiring right now, which, which bodes well for, again, groups that tend to be excluded, older workers, people with disabilities, previously incarcerated or justice-impacted individuals, veterans, and you know others, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of incentive to get people on board. Um, I am not an HR person, I spend a lot of time studying the workforce and labor markets, but you know, I'm, I, I don't have an HR background. Um, that said, from the research, you know, there, there is a lot of evidence um, that diverse workplaces can outperform workplaces with less diversity. There can be more creativity. So I think you know, it, employers need to be thinking about how to capitalize on that. Um, equity audits, you know, it's one thing if you're a large company or you're, a, you know, a tiny company without a chief diversity officer or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, what you do in a small space may be different from in a larger um, company environment, but, you know, you, you, you can actually look at, does the leadership, does our board, do our suppliers, you know, does our workplace resemble the community? Does it, you know, you, you, you can, you can do surveys, you can try and see what the experience of your workers is. Um, and, um, yeah, I think to, you want to make sure that there are equal training and advancement opportunities. You know, if, if you're in a position to have mentors, that seems to be a model based on some research that that can make the workplace feel more inclusive. I'm also a big proponent in, of, of worker voice and trying to 
you know, make people, whatever their job is, they just across the spectrum, you know, from, from the most entry level to the most senior person at the company, that people need to feel that they have a voice in making some decisions that, that, that are respected. And, you know, and I think you, you want to, you have to deliberately and with intentionality create that kind of environment. So. If I can, yes. um, I'm just going to talk about a, a couple experiences over the last few years because I, I spent a long time in the army and we had, you know, we had mandatory, you know, celebrations for certain, mm -hmm. and you can tell when somebody's at a dinner or a luncheon or listening to a talk and they're, they're participating, they're there to listen, they're really absorbing it. Or if they're just, they're checking the box, like I'm a leader in this company, so I have to be at this MLK dinner, right? Or I have to be at this um, pride celebration, and and so I'm I'm not going to say that my leaders in the army weren't truly you know representing, but sometimes they weren't, sometimes they weren't, right? I had a lot of leaders <laughs> <laughs> um, when I transitioned out, uh, and I was in my skill bridge. I was with a very small consulting company, right? And um, so they didn't have a lot of resources. So the HR person was in charge of the DEI, and they she tried to kind of have someone be her partner, and um, you know what, I went to the first DEI call, which we held month every month or every other month, and um, like everyone showed up, and it was awesome. And then all of a sudden, you know, the company's going through these changes and trying to figure out ways to get their bottom line better aligned, and they were like, okay, hey, everyone can attend, but you can't charge this as, as to overhead. You, if you go, then you still have to work another hour like when you're done for the day. So that sent a very strong message, mm -hmm. and not a great one, right? I mean, I was I was really excited to work for this company. It was a, owned by a woman. It was already diverse. It was the first time I've ever worked somewhere where I was like, oh, I know there's another gay person that, that works here. I mean, it, it was so different than my experience in the Army. And then there was this, which was kind of very counter to what I thought it was going to experience there. Um, and then when we talked about creating, you know, goals for the company, we just moved very, very slow. Um, we created the goals and they're, they're like, well, how can we measure these? I'm like, you can measure anything. Of course you can measure it. Like, I mean, you can create a KPI for anything if you want to. Um, and it, it just took a very long time to get there. And so I thought I was, what I just introduced, um, and I'm not an expert in, in anything. And I was new to the company. I was the intern, right? <laughs> I was like, I was like, Hey, these there's external and internal. So, you know, what we may not be able to afford letting everyone have this hour, you know, to build to the company. But um, what we do have is, is our time and what we want to donate. So we're an emergency management consulting company and we're looking at COVID or we're looking at um, response to, you know, forest fires or national disasters. You know, what we can offer is if our clients don't include this equity component, let's include it. And mm -hmm. if, you, if they don't pay for it, we can pay for it. We'll be known for the company that looked at how we responded to the COVID. I mean, that because we see so many. We saw so many COVID ARs. So, so, many, so we already have that expertise. We just have to add it in. And if they don't want it, we're going to say, hey, we're, we're going to give this to you, this chapter for free, because we care about it. And that's speaking to what, um, uh, you know, uh, Frank, I'm sorry, Dr. Douglas. Frank, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, he was speaking about your values. If your values your company, you know, represent, then that's going to be your own brand. It's better than any color you can select or any font that you have on your name. It's what you stand for, right? So that that internal and external. So, you know, they were struggling with that. And I decided to move to a larger company, right? So CWT, and they were in the middle of, you know, their changes. And they're not perfect. But what I would tell you is they created those ERGs. The ERGs right now are meaningful because they are they have measurable goals. Measurable KPIs, uh, they're led by very senior people in the company, and they're sponsored by a member of the ELT. So not only you have a senior person leading, you have an ELT member that's the sponsor and shows up to the call. And then the last thing I'll say is they share the sharing in those are, you know, they're more internal. So if I'm going to the LGBTQ one, there's more, you know, there's just sharing the people that are attending are also LGBTQ, right? Uh, maybe some allies in there. But then they have a once a quarter courageous conversation call. So you're having people from each of the ERGs attend that one. And what you got was, I, I heard a woman share a story of 20 years ago in the company being like, being the only black person at an event where she felt so isolated and she, she heard some, some slurs. It was just very, you know, and she's been holding on to that. I can't believe she stayed with the company, mm -hmm. but she'd been holding on to that for 20 years. And she finally got a chance to share it with the group and have her colleagues understand. 
So, I mean, that's what I think it looks like when you have meaningful participation from your leadership. You measure the goals and you, you have these creative space to share those conversations and make people understand each other. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I want to add to this particular discussion is the importance of representation throughout the organization, mm -hmm. right? Um, oftentimes, especially in public health, healthcare, I can see a lot of representation in the direct service workers, right? Which is important. However, we also need the representation at the executive levels, including your board of directors. And why is that? Because those are the places where the power and the authority resides, where decision making can happen. And that representation is just as important there as it is in mirroring the communities that you're serving and having the direct service workers reflect that. I also just think about place in terms of the work environment in retention um, as much as possible. Is it possible to still retain some type of telework? Is it possible to have a, a four day week for the businesses that you, know, you, you operate? Um, do you have gender neutral restrooms? Is there a place for pregnant persons who are lactating to you know, mm -hmm. pump? Those type of things all matter in terms of thinking about inclusive and equitable workplaces. So our final question before opening up to the audience for questions. Providing examples from your respective industry, how would you make a case for embracing fairness and equity for businesses competing in a global economy? I mean, we spoke about it a little bit here, like what that can look like, but as a final message, what is the impact on a company's bottom line when they are fair and equitable? Maria? Yikes. <laughs> Like, oh, I shouldn't be the first one on that. Um, you know, and in some ways, again, not being an HR person representing an industry, it, it's a little harder in some ways. But what I can say is that um, in early June, we are holding a retreat for community college presidents on racial justice issues. Um, that will be a chance to talk about issues impacting students, but also faculty and staff at the institution, what their experiences are and how to, you know, have a, have a more inclusive environment. So, you know, from that perspective, I, I think um, they serve a very diverse student body, but, you know, they're still some of the same issues. How do you recruit talent? How do you have talent move up? You know, how do you give opportunities? So, you know, I think I'm glad we're doing that. Um, I was going, you were mentioning before that like in healthcare, sometimes you see um, they did, they, the leadership does not look like the service workers, you know, and we have a project for direct support professionals, DSPs, individuals who work with, indi with individuals with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, that's a hard job to recruit for. But the vast majority of the workers are, it's like 90% are women and mostly are women of color and many are not native born women of color who are not English. You know, I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a population that sometimes has no other choice except to take a job like that. And um, there's high turnover, people don't tend to stay. So part of what we are tasked with um, in, we're in partnership with the Office of the Secretary of Higher Education, OSHI, and the public workforce system is trying to build more opportunities for those individuals to help connect them to um, college credits, to take some of their work experience. How do we translate that to some credits? How do we put them on a path so that they might get an associate's degree or some other credential that will let them, if not move into a supervisory job, at least you know give them some other opportunities, which in some ways you say, well, that takes them out of the, <laughs> the job that we need them to be in, but you know, it may enhance their quality of life and their income potential and stuff. So I think you know, we need to be looking at for those hard to recruit jobs that you know, don't pay well and that, that tends to be a lot of occupational segregation. Um, how do we make those better jobs and build those pathways to family sustaining incomes and stuff? So let me stop there. 
Okay. I don't know if that answered your question even <laughs> remotely, but that's, that's, yeah. That's fine, Maria. Thank you. Casey, I think that you had a personal anecdote to share about a consultant you worked with previously. Yes. Um, first, to, to, to capture before I tell that story, I think this is really about, um, it's about the best talent and it's about leadership, right? So we do this um, because we want to hire the best talent and we want to retain the best talent. And the reason you, you, um, your company does well is because you learned about the people in your company. And I don't care you know, what race you are, what your sexual orientation is, where you come from. When you learn about people, when you get to know them, you can bring the best out of them. I mean, that's what I've experienced. The leaders that took the time, that stopped in, checked in, said, hey, Case, how you doing? How was your weekend? They, were, they got to know me. They got to know the things that drove me. I really wanted to work my buns off for them. I was really working hard. I went the extra mile because they connected with me and because they spent a little time to get to know me. And when the whole team gets to know each other, even better. You're going to have better results. That's the ROI that we talked about in the, in the, the, the first conversation. Um, so the story I'll share, because I, I said one thing that I was a little disappointed about with my first company, um, but this is something I was very proud of them for. Um, they hired someone who had long-term laryngitis. She, uh, and that's a consulting company, like 50% of what we do is, is talking, right? Um, uh, and she couldn't talk. She had to type everything, right? But she was brilliant. I mean, I, and, and uh, it took a very small accommodation because if you weren't patient, people could talk over her. Or, you know, if, if what well, basically we did is uh, we created a facilitation guide for her so that, that people would not talk for her. They would give her the nod so that the clients would also be patient and listen and give her the nod. But she was an expert in creating hazard mitigation plans, which are monster, like FEMA, like they're terrible things, but good things, <laughs> right? But she was an SME and she was so good at it. She was brilliant. She quickly became a leader in the company just with this small accommodation. But think of the talent we would have missed if somebody had said, we're not gonna hire someone who can't speak, mm -hmm. but they hired her anyways. And you know, to the benefit of that company, they, they really got a win. So thank you. Terrific example. Diana. Yeah, so I'll go back to, like I mentioned earlier, I think that this is, um, this is really about paving the future. Um, but it's, this is an important dialogue that needs to be had and that needs to continue to be had. Um, so I think what's important is it's great that we're all in the room. Uh, it's important to bring this back. And for the next event, bring a friend. Don't travel <laughs> alone. Who else, who else needs to hear this message um, and bring along so that we can continue to have more of this discussion? Yes, and I'll just add global economy. Is there anyone in here not trying to grow their business? Not <laughs> trying to compete? And so when you think globally, is it monolithic or is it representative? And so in making sure that you have representation to compete in this global economy to attract all consumers, this is what we need to do. All right, enough from us. We're going to open it up for any questions or comments anyone may have. Yes. Good morning. Thank you so much. We have a microphone for you. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, I noticed that um, DEI is very prominently displayed this morning. And I know that belonging is an additional mm -hmm. letter that has been added. But I think Diana was the only one who mentioned belonging. So I'm wondering if you want to expand on that and how important that is to measure inclusion and if the other panelists had anything that they wanted to say about belonging. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's, it is part of, part of what's fun, I think, with the DE&I practice is that it's evolving and it's changing. What we needed to do 20 years ago is different from what we needed to do today, which is different from what we'll need to do 20 years from now. Um, and so to kind of keep up with the times um, and to keep relevant with what's happening in society and what, uh, what our people need, um, that sense of belonging is a, is a super huge one. Um, there's no magic formula to it right now. Um, it's kind of like that cutting edge. It's almost like that cutting edge technology. It's like the AI of DEI. <laughs> <laughs> but it really, it, um, I, what, I, what I also think is fascinating that um, that we see um, that we see happen in a lot of a lot of companies is that um, the HR the role of the HR function has um, has changed and evolved. 
um, and um, the role of DEI has um, has evolved. Um, the two, though, I think are are still very close. Um, it's just a maturity a maturity of um, of the thinking around it. Um, sometimes it may just be a little bit of calling it something new or you know something fresh, so it's important to people um, or becomes becomes interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, what it comes down to, and and what I think is really important, is it's it's human. It's the humanization. And it's thinking at the end of the day that we are still all people. Um, we're past the time of, you know, I think about, I, um, I started my career in banking. Um, and I think about in the late 1990s, what it was like going into the banking environment. Um, and going into the banking environment, you worked from nine to five and you had your employee ID number. I was U755147. <laughs> you had your desk. Which had the four walls. Yeah. Now you walk into now you walk in and and then you know walk in and it was yes, Mister this and yes, Miss this and now you go into a work environment and it's this open concept, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody can look over and can see what you're doing <laughs> now, and, <laughs> and we're all on this first name basis. And but it's um, it's about creating more more humanity, um, and I think that's what the belonging gets to in DE&I that it's not just about, do we all look different? Do we all bring different experience? Mm -hmm. But um, who are we now as people and really getting back to um, who we are as people, what's important to us? What are our values? What do, you know, what do we like? What don't we like? Um, to then, like Casey said, be able to tap into then how to allow each of us to be the best that we could possibly be. Because I think at the end of the day, if we just stood with that simple principle, it's amazing what we could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Casey, Maria, anything to add? Belonging? Yeah. <laughs> I thought Diane did such a great job. She did. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I, I agree. And I think, you know, coming at it from a research perspective, um, I think the terminology is evolving too, right? So sometimes it's DEI, sometimes it's you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Sometimes it's justice, equity, mm -hmm. diversity, and inclusion, or Jedi. You know, I mean, the, I think that people <laughs> are using different vocabulary and trying to emphasize different elements. But I do think the the belonging and the the, the sense of humanity and and people being able to be more authentic in the workplace and all of those are are, are critical. Um, components of the, the work, so, yeah. Absolutely. Hi, our next question is um, online right here. Okay. Okay, so this is on behalf of Damon McDade. Should companies land on employee resource groups or business resource groups, which is best? Can I take that one? Take it, Diane. I, I love that question. Okay. I love that question. <laughs> Um, because I, because I think that's uh, that also goes back to um, the maturity of the model. Uh, so uh, with clients that I work with, this is oftentimes a discussion. Um, should it be an employee resource group? Should it be a business resource group? Um, and and so when you um, when you take a look, employee resource groups I think are where it should start, because at the end of the day we need to again go back to thinking about our people mm -hmm. and focus on focus on your people first and. When you're able to create that sense of community, create that sense of belonging, um, people will open up and then want to bring their best ideas, work hard, um, help the company to succeed. Then taking that momentum um, and shifting it then to a business resource group can be possible because then as a business resource group, now you're saying, how are we going to take your best ideas, your variety of ideas, and infuse them into how we do business? and start bringing that into the way of working or the products that are out there. Um, a great example, a great example of that um, is PepsiCo. Um, I, I love PepsiCo has um, their disability inclusion group. Um, and this was probably like 10 years ago um, that they shifted. You could, see the you could see the shift in the marketplace that it went from just being an ERG to being a BRG because PepsiCo used one of their Super Bowl slots to put in a commercial that was uh, around the disability community. Mm -hmm. um, so if you Google it, it's a, it's a great commercial. It's two gentlemen, they are driving down the street, they're two deaf gentlemen driving down the street to go pick up a friend. And they're in the car, the commercial is completely silent, it has captions, and the one gentleman signs to the other, which house is Rick's? And the other one goes, I don't know, I thought you brought his address. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean? You don't know which house he lives in? And he says, no, 
And then he says, oh, hold on. I have an idea. And he goes and he honks the horn. Now it's like, it's got to be like 11, 12 o'clock at night. The street is black. You can tell everybody's, everybody's asleep. And, um, and he goes and he honks the horn and Rick's house lights up. It flashes, the lights flash on it. And they go, oh, that's the one that we have to go to. And it was just, it was hysterical to see, oh, actually, you know, actually it was the opposite. It was, he honks the horn, every other, every other house lights up. Yep. Except for Rex. That's what it was. <laughs> Except for Rex. Every other house lights up. Right? Can you imagine when I was talking? You're like, what's going on out there? Rick's house, silent. And they go up to the door, and when they ring the doorbell, that's when you see the lights flash. And they go, oh, there we right. go. That's his house. But that's a good, I, I love that example because it shows how it shifted from being an ERG to being a BRG, that they took the best ideas of their people and then brought it into how they do business. And that was a strong message that PepsiCo chose to send during this during the Super Bowl. But if they didn't have that strong ERG, it would have been a strong, it would have been a difficult leap to then going into it being a BRG. Agreed. Yeah. So my quick question, and I just want to thank you, Casey, for being so transparent and sharing KPI and leaders actually taking the lead on ERGs, because I've never seen that. So <laughs> Um, I love that idea, but my question would be, should the DEI, DEI or EI, if you want to call it that, right, equity and inclusion, um, should compensation be part of a leader's overall uh, payout for either participating or not participating in DEI initiatives? <laughs> I don't have the, um, you know, the the approved answer. I'm I'm not <laughs> HR either, <laughs> but I I can tell you being being in business development, I research a lot of companies, and we always look at their values, and you can you can tell the companies that really put importance on it because they pay their employees that run the ERG groups, mm -hmm. um, or uh, they measure somehow an ELT or a leader's participation in EL in in a uh, in ERG. So, I mean, I, I personally, I don't even know exactly what the KPIs are for, for CWT right now. I just know that they do have them and that the leadership involvement is part of that. And um, like I said, I had plenty of army leaders that um, knew they had to participate, but that didn't mean they were really participating. And um, I, I think anyone can tell. Uh, they can tell if it's truly. And so, so sometimes um, I do think um, it's okay that you drag a leader <laughs> to the right place, and then maybe they 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 convert. Um, that that's just you know nobody's perfect, and we're all learning. So you you can only judge a person on their experiences, and if you help them experience those things then maybe they will gain that empathy. They will hear that courageous conversation and they will know um, a little bit more about their team and be able to be a better leader. We haven't talked at all though. I mean, I agree and I, I love the sound of that and a little bit of dragging may be necessary to get people to a better place. Um, the risk sometimes is that there can be a backlash and that you know it, it doesn't always get people to that better place necessarily. I mean, I wish it did, but... You know, I think that's just something to keep in mind too, how to yeah. avoid having that trigger, you know, people feeling, I know, I, I, I think we were going to talk about affirmative action, you know, maybe we started there to some extent. I mean, you know, there are definitely people in workplaces who feel like, well, that person got the promotion because they're a person of color or that person because they're LGBT and we needed somebody, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I think we're all kind of feeling our way through this in some ways. And I, I believe justice and equity and diversity and inclusion and belonging will prevail, but you know, it's a long road. Agree. Mm -hmm. Can I just, can I just uh, comment so. on the, so I currently lead an EBRG for my company. I've been very active with EBRGs in the nine years that I've been with my company. It was my sense of home when I started. Mm -hmm. uh, we did transition from an employee a resource group to an employee business resource group. Hmm. Um, but in terms of compensation, so I'm, I'm probably going to kick myself in the butt here, but <laughs> I don't think that we should get paid a, sal 
a salary to do it. I think it develops more organic leadership when you identify individuals in your company and put them in a leadership role. They don't necessarily have to be senior leaders in our company. I know from my BRG board, I have 14 dynamic leaders from across the enterprise in all lines of business from bargaining unit to mass employees. And when you give individuals the opportunity to develop as leaders, they will get the recognition that they deserve in doing the work and putting the effort behind it. So that's my two cents about that. So, well, my question was kind of answered before. It was about the B for the belonging. And I wanted to go back to that because I feel like um, there is a letter of the day or the month or whatever. <laughs> and it's, it's not that they don't matter. They all very much matter. And definitely belonging matters. I know in my role as a chief diversity officer, I have to make a decision about what's going to take my attention. And, and can I continuously shift with what is... Um, you know, trending this particular day. And so I've been asked about the B for the belonging. I've been asked about adding the letter for abilities and accessibility. And I, I believe right now we're, we're, we're steadfast with our diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think if you do all of those well, you have the abilities covered, you have the belonging, and you can still have specific initiatives that relate to those, but the rebranding of the department and everything, there's so much more in this evolving landscape right now, and I'm running with a lean team, so I just really can't be that agile, so I just kind of stay with right now with diversity, equity, inclusion. We did two years ago add um, the equity piece of it, and I believe that diversity is really important because you can have equity and inclusion and look around the room and lack your diversity. So I think that's the mm -hmm. core foundational piece that you know kind of stay there with that. I see a lot of people are, are dropping that. And uh, so that's kind of where, where I stand with that. And then I wanted to speak about that piece about whether or not um, compensation should be tied to, um, to DEI performance. And I think uh, that not even just my thought, it is, uh, research base of a best practice that it is linked conversation is linked with that I think that's where you get into your leadership accountability so when you start engaging your executive leaders um, conversation is tied into those things that 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 are are linked with those high strategic priorities and so DEI if that company is really valuing that that needs to part be a part of that leadership accountability to tie that in something like that has to be championed by your board and your CEO so I'm going to take Ivania with me when I speak to my CEO. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ivania, I, I agree with you. Um, but my name is Suzette Robinson. I work for RWG Barnabas Health. When we started the system back in 2016, when we, the system was merged and became one, it was birthed back in 2016. We had seven BRGs. Right now, we're at 50 BRGs. Wow. So um, the value, in fact, is there. It helps to build pipelines within our organization. And we have some of our DNI leaders right here that could really speak to that. But I do agree that it starts with the leader of, that, of our organizations, right? All of the managers, all of the directors that's allowing our employees time to attend these meetings. It starts with them. It starts with them believing in fact, that this is making a difference, that this is a focus group all the time. Because every month, our BRG listing um, you know, for, of our events may be upwards of 10 pages a month mm -hmm. of different offerings to our employees. Mm -hmm. So what we're finding in our system is that our leaders are really investing into their employees and allowing them to go to meetings, allowing them to be a part of something that is like really bigger than our organization. Our employees look forward to being a part of these meetings and being involved. It's really helping us to create an inclusive environment. So if you do not have them, I would really recommend that you invest in creating them for your organization. I just wanted to add that. Right here. Um, Reggie with Hope Works, just a question. Um, so what type of concrete steps um, can an organization uh, move away, uh, to take to move away from that performative uh, DEI? and efforts to you know, get that inclusive uh, culture. 
anyone? Well, I, th I think this is, um, it's been answered by, it's, uh, in a couple different ways, but uh, I think from what the comments in the crowd and up here starts with the leadership. Um, and then, it, you know, you can have it, you know, somebody who's very passionate about lead the ERG, you can have uh, a leader in the company lead the ERG. I think as long as you, you make the space, right? For, I mean, I think the ERGs are great, but I've seen them someplace where they, they were uh, sort of check the box, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, I attended that courageous conversation where they brought the ERGs together and the leadership was there. And the, the stories that were shared were so powerful and so moving that they were more than one wake-up call at that at that uh, that conversation. And when when those those vulnerabilities are shared, and you're out allowing people to feel valued, to feel like they belong, you are going to get the best work out of your people. So I mean, start just with the conversation. Start with what you know. Who wants to to help me build this? Um, and and then get the buy-in from the boss because. <laughs> If the boss isn't on board, it, it will be hard. It will be hard. Well, this is our time. Yikes. Oh, one, one more? Question. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> we got permission. I, I, <laughs> we were all threatened about that red clock. <laughs> we, 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 we got the yes. memo, yeah. <laughs> So I just had a question for maybe a smaller organization that we don't have the DAI initiatives going yet, and we're at a space where cost might overshadow the value of making these changes. Do you have any recommendations on basically how to communicate to leadership to get that buy-in by mm -hmm. chance? Go well, I mean, I, I'm always throwing myself under the bus here. Um, <laughs> I'd say it just starts just like I said before, like who's passionate about it? Um, if there's one person, then that's enough. And then, you know, get on the, the boss's calendar. Say, hey, this isn't gonna cost you anything. I just wanna have a meeting during lunch. And whoever wants to come, we'll, we'll do it. And there's, you know, there's a ton of information out on, on the internet, so you can find some resources already, but it will develop organically. And you're right, small businesses don't have a lot of additional resources, but it, I mean, I use a small example of everyone's been on a team where they felt a little out of place or they went to a party where they didn't know anybody and somebody came up to them and they were, they made them feel like they belonged. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's what it is in your company. Um, so that that person can bring their whole self there. I mean, and that does not take a lot of, a lot of investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would just piggyback on that. Um, there is a lot of evidence that it can help reduce turnover, right? Turnover is a huge expense for small businesses. So mm -hmm. if you can make people feel like they're invested in their opportunity to stay, you know, that that can help. I think it can help you recruit. Um, you might have partnerships with organizations that, you know, bring in talent, but then are also customers for your business. You know, so I think there's a lot of ways to spin it um, that it's just, makes good sense in this day and age. Yeah, I agree with Maria. I think it goes back to, you have to um, start with the question of why, um, and then put yourself in the shoes of your CEO or your owner. Um, why would they say yes to this? What's it, how does it align with what's important to um, them as the leader of the organization or to where they're looking to take the organization? Um, and then there are tons of things you can do that don't cost money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are tons of things. Just be ready if you raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. Right. No problems without solutions, right? Yeah. All right. So I'm confident that I speak for our esteemed panelists and thanking you for your attention and participation. Thank you.